Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Mark and CIRM, for another excellent um, conference. It's great to be back here again. Um, it's rather curious, actually. Whenever there's a referendum or a general election in the UK, I seem to be at a conference and lecturing on that day. I remember well three and a half years ago at a conference in California on the day of that um, the UK voted to leave the European Union, and I rem remember at breakfast the next day we were sitting around all feeling very depressed. And I have every confidence that after today's general election, some of us will be sitting around at breakfast tomorrow feeling very depressed. <laughs> <laughs> um, OK, well, I'm going to be talking about um, some things we've been looking at recently with um, John and Tom and um, Stuart Burrell, who's a research student of John and myself. And um, John, at the end of his talk, mentioned, well, there are all sorts of different sorts of dimension one can consider, so I'm going to be talking about a few of these during this talk. So um, I'm really going to be concerned with sets in, and I'm going to stick entirely to Euclidean space, um, sets that have a different value of Hausdorff dimension and box counting dimension or Minkowski dimensions. Um, and what I want to talk about mainly is that um, you can really think of Hausdorff dimension and box counting dimension as at the two ends of a spectrum of dimensions um, with um, taking a value of theta between zero and one. Zero conf corresponding to Hausdorff dimension and one corresponding to box dimension. And I'll introduce these intermediate dimensions in a moment, but the idea is they give an idea of the range of sizes of covering sets needed to get good estimates when you're calculating Hausdorff dimension. So can you get away with you know, sets of small covering sets of more or less the same size, or is it essential that you have some getting very, very small? And then I'm going to be talking a bit about how potential theoretic methods um, actually provide a much easier way of looking at some of these things than um, some of the methods we were looking at um, earlier, and I'll be talking a bit about um, geometrical properties such as orthogonal projection. So um, the usual way of defining Hausdorff dimension is via Hausdorff measures, and um, the Hausdorff dimension of a set is the critical value where the Hausdorff measure jumps from infinity to zero. Um, but there is another way of defining Hausdorff dimension without having to go through Hausdorff measures. Namely, it's the smallest value of S, such as for all positive numbers, you can find a cover of your set such that the sum of the S powers of the diameters of your covering set is less than or equal to epsilon. And it's not difficult to see that that's directly equivalent to the version you get if you go via Hausdorff measures. And then, um, just to remind you of the definitions of um, box counting dimensions or Minkowski dimensions, um, for, throughout we'll assume that the sets we're working with are non-empty and compact, so we don't have any problems with the definitions of box dimensions. Um, and we can define the lower and upper box counting dimensions by taking a, the lower and upper limits of the ratio of the log of the NRE, which is the least number of sets of diameter R that can cover E, um, divided by minus log of R. So um, the box dimension, um, if the box dimension is D, that means that NRE is roughly R to the minus D. Um, and for most of the sets we're going to be talking about, you, you can forget the lower and the upper variants. Um, usually, well, very often at least, they're the same. And as far as the theory goes, um, you can substitute lower and upper in almost everything that we do. So um, just think of box dimension and don't worry too much about lower and upper limits. Um, but with this definition, instead of looking at the covering number, you can look at... Um, a collection of um, sets, small sets UI covering your set E, all of the same diameter, and you can look at um, the, the smallest value of S you can get such that the sum of these numbers, which are all the same, is less than or equal to epsilon. And so this is completely equivalent to um, these um, definitions, and similarly for the um, upper, well, there's an upper variant of this we'll see in a moment. Um, 
And so that's a slightly different way of getting to the same number, um, simply um, just adding up um, S powers of the constant diameter of your covering sets. Um, and the point is that this definition of Hausdorff Hausdorff dimension and this definition of box counting dimension really look very similar. The only difference is here there's no restriction on the covering set size of the covering sets at all, whereas here you're forced to take all of the covering sets to be of the same size. And that motivates our definitions of intermediate um, dimension. Um, so we're going to extend this idea. Um, and, and so for a set which I'll always assume to be um, non-empty and bounded, and theta a parameter between naught and one, the lower um, corresponding to the um, lower um, theta dimension, as we call it, the lower intermediate dimension of a set is the, the infimum of S such that for all epsilon we can find arbitrarily small delta such and um, a cover of E by small sets UI um, such that the diameter of the sets UI range between um, delta to the 1 over theta and delta and again the sum of the S powers, ooh, how did that happen? The sum of the the sum of the S powers is less than um, epsilon. And similarly for the um, upper intermediate dimension, instead of um, for existing arbitrarily small delta, for all sufficiently small delta, um, you can find a cover for which this same um, condition is satisfied. So um, the point about this is these, when I take um, theta, to be zero, then you recover um, the Hausdorff measure from either of the definitions. And when theta equals one, you, you are just forcing all the covering sets to be the same, so you recover the upper or lower box counting dimensions. And um, it's very easy to see that um, the intermediate dimensions lie between the um, Hausdorff dimension and the box counting dimension in the natural way. So those are the intermediate um, dimensions, and um, we hope that this actually provides further useful information about sets that is, in a sense, finer than Hausdorff dimension and box counting dimension individually. So um, some very simple properties which are fairly straightforward from the definition, very straightforward def from the definition. The upper theta dimension, just like upper box counting dimension, is finitely stable. Um, the dimension, upper dimension of a union is the maximum of the um, individual upper dimensions of individual sets. Um, and provided we're not in the Hausdorff dimension case, then um, you're actually working with, um, essentially you could only have to bother about finite covers and um, so it's easy to see that these intermediate dimensions are unchanged if you replace a set by its closure just as with box counting dimension. Um, and then um, we can get estimates just by looking at natural coverings for upper and lower dimensions of products of sets um, and this reflects what, what we have for Hausdorff and um, box counting dimension um, breaking up, um, comparing the dimensions of the, some of the dimensions of the individual sets with the dimensions of the product. And um, for the upper bound, you need the, the box counting dimension there rather than just the theta dimension. And um, John mentioned um, by Lipschitz um, invariance conditions, and just like Hausdorff and box counting dimension, the intermediate. Um, dimensions of a set are preserved under by Lipschitz mappings, so um, where the distances are not increased by more than a certain ratio and not decreased by more than a certain ratio under a, 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 a such a mapping. Um, so those are some straightforward properties. Um, and then another very useful property um, is the well, initially the following inequality, um, where are we? That um, clearly um, the theta dimension is um, increasing, not necessarily strictly increasing, um, because as um, theta increases, 
you are putting more and more restrictions on the allowable range of diameters of covering sets. Um, but you can also get an upper bound um, because if you've got um, a covering of E by sets of diameter, let's put it this way round, diameter between delta and delta to the theta, then to get a covering by sets of diameter between delta and delta to the phi, where phi is bigger than theta, you take all the um, covering sets that are already eligible for the larger value, and those that aren't, you simply chop up into um, pieces whose um, diameter is delta to the theta, and then you count up what you've got, and you can get this upper bound. Um, similarly, for upper, di upper dimensions, exactly the same inequalities. Um, and um, an immediate consequence of this is that um, except possibly at theta equals zero, when you hit Hausdorff dimension, the intermediate dimensions are continuous in theta for a given set. Um, so um, I'm going to mention the Aswar dimension, which John alluded to at the end, um, because it does actually give us a way of getting sometimes useful lower bounds for theta dimensions. Um, this is the, don't worry too much about the formal definition of Aswa dimension. It's the smallest value of S um, such that there's a constant such that the number of, you know, that for all um, X in your set and for all little r smaller than big R, the number, the, the, the covering number of sets of, um, the, the, the number of sets of diameter small r needed to cover E intersection, ball centre x and radius big R is, is bounded above by r over, big R over little r to the power s. And um, it's not difficult to see that that definition gives a um, definition of um, dimension that's bigger than most of, well, almost all of the other ones. Um, and um, in general, in particular, the Aswa dimension is bigger than the upper box dimension. Um, and with that, it's not difficult to obtain um, a lower bound for um, the theta dimension of E in this um, sense. And in particular, you see if the Aswa dimension equals the um, upper, um, the lower box dimension, then um, actually for all theta bigger than, strictly bigger than zero, the Aswa dimension and the theta dimension and the uh, and the um, upper box dimension are all equal. Um, sorry, lower box dimension, they are all equal. And similarly for the upper dimensions. Um, I simply mention this because it's actually useful in constructing examples such as the following. So um, let's start with some simple examples. Um, well known um, set that one examines fairly early on when you start to. Um, study fractal geometry, um, the um, p power sets or one over p power sets, um, simply a sequence of points tending to zero, um, you take to make the set compact, you take zero and then it's one over n, the, all, all the points of the form one over integer n to the power p, so the set looks like that. Since it's a countable set, the Hausdorff dimension will be zero and um, a fairly straightforward exercise is to show that the box counting dimension, both upper and lower box counting dimensions of this set are equal to one over p plus one. And um, with a little bit more effort, you can calculate the theta dimension, theta intermediate dimensions, both upper and lower, <coughs> and that is of the form theta over p plus theta, depending on this um, p. So that's a simple example where we can see a nice continuous variation, continuous strictly increasing variation of the theta dimensions going from um, the um, zero up to um, one over p plus one. So um, with this example, we can construct various other examples. I've just got a few graphs to show you um, the sort of behavior one can get. So plotting um, the theta dimension, and in, in the cases we're looking at, both the upper and lower theta dimensions are the same, um, the sort of behavior we can get. If you take um, the sort of um, one over p, n to the p dimension, uh, one of n to the p set rather with p going to zero, you get the logarithmic set um, and being countable, the Hausdorff dimension is zero, but the box dimension of that is actually one. So you've got a 
sudden jump from zero to one there and constant um, for theta bigger than zero. On the other hand, if you took the, take the one, one over n set together with any set E with Hausdorff and box dimension equal to one third, then this um, set E dominates to begin with and then um, the set E1 takes over. So you've got continuity, a constant bit there and um, a strictly increasing bit there. Um, if you take E1, if you take a set whose lower box dimension and Aswa dimension equal one quarter, then you get a jump at zero, then a flat bit, then monotone increasing. And if you take the product of um, the one over n set um, with the log set, then you get a jump at zero and strictly increasing. So those are the different sorts of behavior one can get um, for a different set. So there's quite, quite a lot of different possibilities there. Um, OK, so um, let's look at a more interesting example. And these are the Bedford McMullen um, carpets, um, which um, are self-affine sets. So you start with a square and you um, split it into um, a certain number of columns and rather more rows. And then you um, use the usual um, affine transformations. This template defines the set obtained by um, repeatedly substituting the whole picture, but a, an affine image of it, so squashed more in the vertical di direction than the horizontal direction. So um, repeatedly substituting in this figure uh, reduced affine, reduced size affine copies in itself, um, and you iterate, um, you get a self-affine set which looks like that. And these were studied in, I think, about 1984 by Tim Bedford and Kirk McMullen independently. Um, so, oh yes, yeah, so, so there, there are some, a different example, a two by three. Um, so two columns, th three rows, and three columns and five rows. A couple more examples there. These were studied um, independently by Bedford and McMullen. And, um, they found the Hausdorff and Box dimension of these self-affine carpets. Um, so if we've got a P by Q carpet, P columns and Q rows, um, the box dimension is quite easy to calculate. It's given by this um, formula. Um, so N is the total, uh, sorry, capital N is the number of non-empty columns that you've got. And then NJ is the number of um, rectangles selected in the jth column, then this formula gives the box dimension. Um, it's equal both the lower and the upper box dimension. A little bit harder is the Hausdorff dimension of this, which is given by um, this formula um, where nj is the um, number of rectangles selected in the jth column. And unless um, NJ is the same for all the um, non-empty columns. These two values are strictly different. And um, so you've got, you've got a situation where the box dimension and the Hausdorff dimension um, differ. So um, they calculated the um, Hausdorff and box dimension. And this is a natural candidate where we might want to calculate the um, intermediate dimensions of these self-affine carpets. Um, and this turns out to be quite a challenging problem, which we're still working on. Um, we've got upper and lower bounds. Um, so um, this is an upper bound. And th this is a horrible estimate. It really shoots off. But it's enough to show that um, as theta tends to 0, then the um, intermediate dimension tends to the Hausdorff dimension. As theta tends to 0, this horrible quantity tends to um, 0, and you're left with um, the Hausdorff dimension. So we do actually get, in, this, in the case of these Bedford McMullen carpets, we do get the intermediate dimensions continuous at um, 0. And um, the proof, um, well, basically you put a Bernoulli measure on the, the, um, or the um, code space underlying E, and you show that uh, you look at approximate squares 
related to the rectangles in the construction, and you show that um, for all points in the construction, um, you can find a measure such that the measure of the proximate square is um, more or less at least um, the side length of the square to the power d plus a little bit, and you can always find such a k over that range between capital K and capital K over theta, um, and that gives the um, gives the required result. The, the, the detailed argument, even for this horrible bound, is quite technical. I don't want to say any more about that. Um, and then um, the lower bound, we get a bit better um, answer. This time, you're really using an, a mass distribution principle. You have to put a, um, f depending on um, K, you construct a measure mu K on the set and show that over an appropriate range of little k that the um, mass of um, the approximate squares is no bigger than um, the side of length of the square to the appropriate um, d prime, which is that quantity. Um, <coughs> The, the intermediate dimension, yes, is strictly between the Hausdorff dimension and the box counting dimension, as I mentioned before. Um, yes, just about. Um, let me show you. Let me show you a graph or very crude um, picture of the sort of thing we get. Um, the Lower bound, um, we've got a linear bit there. The upper bound shoots off extremely rapidly up there. This is much sharp, much steeper than that. And then you hit the box dimension, which is always an upper bound. So that's the picture you've got. We're still working on this, and we believe we should be able to get rather better um, estimates than these um, rather poor estimates. Um, a nice conjecture, would you, we, you get a straight line from there to there. Um, I think that might be a bit optimistic, um, but um, originally we thought that we could get that for a lower bound, but there turned out to be a mistake in that argument. So that's the picture we've got for the um, carpets. Um, okay, let me, want, let me move on to thinking about um, some geometrical properties of um, these various dimensions. And let me start by reminding you of the classical um, result from 1954 in the plane and um, later in um, high, high dimensions for the projections of fractals. So here's the plane picture. Um, you've got um, a set in the, the plane projecting onto um, a one-dimensional subspace. I'm going to use alpha to denote um, in the plane simply that angle which, which um, parameterizes the subspace, and in higher dimensions, um, if I'm talking about m-dimensional subspaces, then alpha will just represent a generic um, m-dimensional subspace, just, just for simplicity. And the classical theorem say that the um, because projections are um, a Lipschitz mapping, the dimension of the projections are never more than the Hausdorff dimension of the original set. You're, if you project from a set in n-dimensional space to an m-dimensional subspaces, then with a natural um, measure on the Grassmannian, um, you've always got that as an upper bound. And the big part of these theorems is you get equality here, namely the dimensional projection equals this number for almost all um, subspaces or almost all lines in the plain case um, alpha. Um, and you need to, one way of thinking about this number, the minimum of the Hausdorff dimension of E and the um, value M, is that's the dimension that a set in Rn looks like if you view it from in the m-dimensional context. So if you just sort of think of a m-dimensional photograph of an n-dimensional set, then viewed from the m-dimensional perspective, that's typically the number of that's the dimension of what you see. And it's worth thinking about that um, in what we're going to do now. So um, that's, the, um, that's the fundamental result on projection theorems for Hausdorff dimension. And it's natural to ask what happens for other definitions of dimension. Let me just mention um, the, um, why 
well, one way of getting these results. The upper bound is simply that the projection is a Lipschitz map, which cannot increase dimension. That's straightforward. Um, the lower bound, Marstrand's original proof was quite complicated. And then Kaufman, I think in the 1970s, I can't remember the exact date, pointed out that um, there's a much easier way if you use potential theory. Um, you can define the capacity of a set in this way. Um, you look at um, probability measures on your set E, and you look at the minimum energy with respect to the kernel 1 over x minus y to the power s, um, and um, the capacity is the reciprocal of the minimal energy over all measures. And um, going back to Frostman, the Hausdorff dimension is the supremum of the s for which you have um, a positive capacity, in other words, the um, largest S for which you can find a measure with finite energy. And um, with that, um, Kaufman's argument then becomes very straightforward. Um, and here was the proof of um, Marstrand's theorem, um, for, for the plane at least. And if S is between 0 and 1, um, and you write mu alpha for the natural projection of mu onto the line in direction of alpha, then um, you can simply um, replace a, an energy integral with respect to mu alpha um, on the line um, and integrate it from naught to pi. You can replace, um, you, you can use the definition of the projection of measure to um, replace this um, as an integral with respect to the original measures, provided you take the dot product with a vector in direction alpha there. If s equals 1, you can integrate out the um, direction um, vector there, and you're simply left with this energy expression there, um, integrating with respect to um, alpha. And now, um, if s is Less, less than the dimension, you can find a measure mu for which that is finite, in which case that integral is finite, so this, in, this energy integral on the, of, um, which mu alpha sits on the projected set will be finite for almost all alpha, and that's going back to the equivalence of Hausdorff's dimension and capacity, that's the proof of that. The thing I want to emphasize is that there is this relationship between Hausdorff's dimension and capacities. Let's move on to box counting dimension. Um, and I've just reminded you of the definitions there where N, N R L R E is the smallest number of sets of diameter R required to cover E. Um, so that's the lower and upper box dimension. You lose nothing by assuming that the, they're equal, that the limit exists. Um, so it's natural to ask whether there's a Marstrand type theorem for box dimensions. And things are a little bit more complicated because examples of um, Yavan Parr and Matilla and myself going some years back show that um, you can find um, a, set, a set in n-dimensional space whose m-dimensional projections lie anything between there and there. There's quite a lot of flexibility, and those bounds are best possible. So um, the natural question to ask is, um, even so, is there an almost sure um, value of the dimension of the projections, of the box dimensions of the projections? Um, and some years ago with um, John Howroyd, we showed by an extraordinarily messy and indirect argument, yes, there was, but I was never very happy with that argument. And so I looked, had another look at this um, um, two or three years ago. And using capacities, you can do everything in a much simpler way. Um, and the thing is, you have to choose the right kernels for the um, capacity. And the kernels to use are um, these. So um, for a parameter s greater than 0 and um, a scale r, we define the kernel phi r s to be 1 for um, if the absolute, if, if the norm of x is between 0 and r, and then it tails off like r over x to the s um, for larger, um, if the norm of x is larger. And the reason for using this kernel is that if you look at, um, evaluate it at um, a difference between two um, points x and y, then this is comparable to the Lebesgue measure, I'm just thinking in the plane now, the Lebesgue measure of alpha such that the projection of the vector joining x and y 
um, in direction alpha is less than r, so is small. Um, and so that's the crucial property of these kernels. And just as with um, the Hausdorff dimension case, we then use these kernels to define um, an energy. We find the minimum energy, and we define the cap capacity, which I'm now deno denoting by CRS to correspond to the kernel phi RS um, as the reciprocal of the, um, of the minimum energy. So, uh, and it's very easy to see that this infimum is attained by some equilibrium measure, at least one equilibrium measure. Um, so with that, um, it it's with a little bit of effort, you can show that for a um, set I can assume to be compact, um, these capacities are actually comparable to the box cap, the, the covering number at scale r. In fact, if s is greater than n, so this parameter s in the kernel is bigger than n, then um, nr epsilon nr of e, sorry, is directly, the covering number is directly comparable to the capacity. If s equals n, then you get a logarithmic term coming in, which doesn't make much difference. And so in particular, if you um, take the log, take logarithms and look at the ratio, that means that the limits of the log of the capacity divided by minus log r are the same as the limits of the log of the covering number divided by minus log r, which we, by definition, in the, if you take lower limits, is the lower box counting dim, dimension of E. And similarly, for if you take the, lim, the upper limit, you get the upper box counting dimension. Um, and that happens provided that S is greater than or equal to N. Um, but rather importantly, these inequalities fail if um, zero, or one side of them fails if zero if s is less than n. But it's this failure of these um, inequalities or, or these equivalences that um, turns out to be extremely useful when working with projections. So um, the theorem improved a few years ago, or about three or, three or four years ago anyway, um, is that for a reasonable set, in our n-dimensional, um, we've got a Marstrand type theorem, named the box dimension of the projection of alpha, uh, the projection onto the this this is in this is in the um, this this is in um, projecting from R n to m-dimensional subspaces. So the box dimension of the projection onto m-dimensional subspaces alpha of E is um, no more than the limit of this um, capacity ratio where, where I'm now using M even though E sits in N dimensions. So this is different from the case we had below. By choosing a different um, parameter in my kernel, um, we actually get um, an inequality that is always true for the dimensions of the projections. And the nice property is that we get equality here for almost all projections onto m-dimensional subspaces um, from Rn with a natural measure on the Grassmannian, and similarly for the lower box dimension. And um, again, well, for historic reasons, really, we, we, we call um, this, <coughs> this number the m-dimensional dimension profile. Um, you can think of as m varies, you get through different dimensions, you get a different aspect of the set as you view it. And you think of this number given by this limit as the, the box dimension of your set E when viewed from an n-dimensional perspective, just as I indicated before. Um, OK, so um, that's the theorem. I'm not going to dwell on the proof of that. Um, it's not difficult providing you're working with capacities and energies. Um, but let's now go back to where we start, well, where we started more or less on these intermediate dimensions. And um, recently, we, um, having introduced intermediate dimensions, um, a natural question is, are there decent Marstrand type projection theorems? Um, and not all dimensions allow you to do this. Um, Aswa dimension, um, John 
came up with examples to show that you can have very different um, dimensions of as well dimensions of projections in different directions. Um, and there's no master and type theorem, but it turns out for intermediate dimensions there is, and um, we can use capacities and energies again to obtain these results. And the thing is here, we have to use a rather more complicated kernel, um, which depends on R, which is the scale, theta, which is the intermediate value between naught and one, and um, S um, and M. And so it's easier to see from the picture rather than the formula what these kernels look like. You start off as with box dimension, constant one between zero and R. Then you go off, um, you decrease at a rate um, R divided by the norm of X, all, right, all to the power S for a bit. And S is less than or equal to M, by the way. And then you hit R, when you get to R to the theta, um, you, and R of course is small, you um, go at a different rate given by this, this number. So you're going at a, a rate the norm of X to the um, M, and so you go off like that. And it turns out these are the right kernels to use for um, working with projections of intermediate dimensions. And you can relate these to the sums that occur, the, the sum of S powers of sets, where you're just looking at sets over a restricted range of diameters. Um, you can relate those sums to these kernels. And um, exactly as with um, box counting dimension, um, we define the energy with respect to these kernels. The capacity is the um, reciprocal of the min minimum energy. And then um, the um, dimension one has to define here is that um, dim m theta of e. So that is the unique value of s over the range 0 to m, such that the limit of this ratio of the log of the capacity to minus log r equals s. And you can show there's a unique value of s for which you get that. And then um, it turns out that um, if um, that um, if you take um, S equals, if you take M equals N, then um, you recover the theta dimension itself. But um, for um, other values of um, S, so uh, coming back to the plane case here, um, we've got a Marstrand type theorem, namely the theta dimensions of projections is always less than or equal to um, this value I just indicated, um, depending on theta. Um, one means you're projecting onto one dimensional subspaces. And again, um, that is always true. And we get equality for almost all um, for almost all directions, for almost all one-dimensional subspaces. And um, this also works for projections in higher dimensions. So having introduced the intermediate direct dimensions, then um, they're nice in the sense that um, not only do they give us more information about dimensions of sets, and, but they also um, work very nicely with respect to projections. Um, so I've tried to indicate that, and thank you for your attention.